everyone. Uh, this is uh, Paul Davis, uh, Director of Market Intelligence with uh, SRM, uh, subbing in for Larry Press this week with SRM Tech Talks, a uh, forum where we discuss everything from digital assets to AI, automation, anything related to technology um, in the uh, banking and financial services space. Uh, today, we have two fantastic guests. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, Ian, why don't you start us off, introduce yourself, and help us understand the the professional journey that uh, took you uh, to meeting Stephen and co-founding uh, our feature company today, Jolts Rewards. Absolutely. No, excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, my name is Ian Major. I'm the co-founder and head of business development at Jolts. Uh, we are a Bitcoin rewards company, so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what that is, how 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 that works. Um, my professional background, I worked for a number of years as a consultant. We had a proprietary analytics platform uh, called Test and Learn, which is funny. We sort of throw that phrase around now pretty casually, um, but we, you know, we had a trademark on it and everything. So you know, I was helping large, uh, both merchants and financial institutions with all sorts of business questions and trying to help them answer questions of causality. So we changed this part of the business what causal impact did that have on you know, different KPIs, et cetera. Um, interestingly enough, we were acquired by MasterCard. Uh, MasterCard made a big push around um, you know, differentiating capabilities, analytics platforms, data, uh, you know, AI, machine learning, all that sort of stuff. And so uh, that was also interesting. And as part of that acquisition, um, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, lead our sort of test and learn business unit in the Middle East and Africa region. Um, sharing kind of some of the learnings we had built out in North America um, and, you know, getting a, a very powerful glimpse into, you know, the, the world of um, uh, financial institutions. We did a whole, whole lot of work. And so that was part of the impetus, you know, this realization that there's all these sophisticated loyalty platforms and personalization engines and contextualization engines that organizations are investing in. And yet, if you peel the onion back and look at what consumers are really saying, uh, there are really some more foundational pieces that uh, that they want. You know, they want more value, they want more flexibility uh, in terms of the loyalty rewards that they uh, that they you know earn. So we'll go into uh, that a bit more. Um, Steve and I happen to uh, be childhood friends, so that's the easy answer for how how we um, kind of came together. And I think we both always had the entrepreneurial bug. And so I'll let Stephen introduce himself, and then we can uh, get a little bit more into into some of the topics for today. Yeah, again, thanks for having me. Um, Stephen, uh, co-founder of Jolts, uh, heading up product and operations. Um, yeah, luckily Ian and I have not gotten sick of each other yet after these many years. Um, but uh, now we, we we get along well. Um, but yeah, uh, my background is um, I was a systems engineer um, at Dell Technologies, overseeing Bank of America. Uh, JP Morgan, some of the larger you know financial institutions and their uh, their infrastructure nationally. So everything you know from pre-sales to you know actually delivering and implementing you know large scale um, you know, clusters and virtual environments, you name it. Um, the the world's you know data ran and still runs on on Dell as we like to say, um, whether people like to believe it or not. But it's 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 a large chunk. Um, and yeah, I just really got into the. Uh, I think you know we both kind of got into the. The crypto space, if you will, um, you know, probably back at the uh, late 2016, 2017 bull run, and I had heard about it, you know, a couple of years before, just from my networking background and hearing about blockchain in some of my classes, and wish I had taken a more serious look at it um, back then. Um, but ultimately, we just, uh, you know, we had our time looking at all these other protocols and network, and um, ultimately just found that, you know, Bitcoin is, in our opinion, and you know, we strongly and firmly believe it, as you'll see in our product, um, is really the only uh, you know, blockchain to build on, um, just given its, you know, pristine nature. Um, it's always up, you know, always uptime, and um, just all the, uh, you know, other attractive traits and um, value propositions that we'll, we'll definitely cover here in the, the discussion. Well, that's terrific, terrific. And I will mention to everybody that there will be time at the end for questions. But if you do have a question for these guys uh, that's really pressing and uh, time sensitive, feel free to raise your hand put something in the chat, I can call on you guys to have a uh, to put it out there simply because this is a very interactive uh, forum here at Tech Talks. Uh, but let's start out. Let's just talk about the the idea of loyalty programs. I mean, there, there are plenty of loyalty programs out there, right, in various industries, whether it's traditional retail, financial services, et cetera. 
obviously customization, personalization is, is, is a thing as well. But what are some of the foundational consumer pain points that you guys feel aren't really being met with existing programs and, uh, and, and existing platforms? Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, this has been looked at in a number of different kind of publications. I think Harvard Business Review did a really great study on this. I think McKinsey's done a great study on this. But what's interesting is, as I was alluding to earlier, you know, there's all this investment and all this, you know, sophisticated technology being brought to bear to get the right offer to the right person in the right context at the right time, you know, all of these things. And yet, as you're suggesting, Paul, you know, there are a couple of very just foundational things that this sort of back to basics idea that I think a lot of organizations can double down on to make sure that they have the right foundation before they start doing, you know, all these more sophisticated kind of bells and whistles. And the two things that come out time and time again, and again, I saw this in, um, you know, when we would look at and measure the overall efficacy of a, of a given loyalty program, is a difficult analysis to do. But number one, what often comes out is value. And, um, you know, and this is interesting, like you look at some of the, you know, I was pulling up a sampling of examples, um, you know, what happens with traditional loyalty points is that they have a tendency to be uh, diluted, right? And so, you know, I, the consumer, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, bringing my loyalty to a particular business and the reward that I'm earning, uh, you know, that's all fine and good. But what happens is that over time that gets, you know, the value of those points in terms of what I can redeem it for systematically gets devalued. And there's a lot of reasons for why that can happen. You know, a lot of, you know, businesses, uh, if there's, you know, a downturn or if they're facing cost pressures themselves, um, it's much easier to, you know, the the release valve in that case, it's much easier to devalue something like your loyalty points than to outright raise the prices of your, you know, whatever it is that, that you sell, whatever good or, or service it is. And so just to give you some examples, this is over the last, you know, year or two, um, Starbucks, you know, notably earlier this year, uh, increased how many how many stars it takes to uh, redeem, you know, coffee. So this represented a 33 to 50 percent, depending on uh, the type of redemption, uh, you know, devaluation in in the value of points. So you can appreciate, you know, consumers are very upset by that. Um, you know, the city points for uh, American Airlines, you know, 20 to 40 percent devaluation over the last couple of years. So these are big numbers, right? And consume they're big enough to where consumers notice it. It's not just, you know, a little couple of percentage points here and there. And so I think one observation is just how can, you know, how can an organization, um, you know, structure their program to where that systematic devaluation is not as necessary a component uh, because that's really bleeding into, you know, consumers' perception of value for these different loyalty programs. So that's point, you know, sort of bucket one. And bucket two, I think is this idea of choice and optionality. Um, you've seen, of course, a lot of different, you know, loyalty platforms and providers uh, that offer all sorts of different ways that you can redeem your points. And that's that's very, very important. Um, but you know, again, you you sort of still hear that, that drumbeat and, um, you know, in our ever, kind of accelerating world of digitization and all this different stuff, like those consumer expectations are sort of constantly increasing. Hey, I should be able to uh, redeem, you know, I should be able to have more redemption options. I should be able to uh, maybe transfer this form of value into a different form of value. Um, you know, maybe if I have airline miles, I want to much more easily be able to redeem those for a discounted hotel stay. And, you know, you have some of that today, but oftentimes it's either very clunky for the consumer uh, or there's a lot of value that leaks out of those different value transactions. And so maybe you've got, you know, $50 of value that suddenly becomes 40. And so those are, I think, two really big categories that, again, are very foundational. And, uh, you know, that is not to say that all the kind of personalization stuff isn't valuable. It definitely is. Uh, but, you know, there's there's often you know, even lower hanging fruit, at least that we've seen in our experience. And I was going to say to weigh in on that, to your point, I mean, these are usually very monoline. For example, going back to the Starbucks example, you get your Starbucks points. It's not like you can take any of those rewards and apply them to, say, 
you know, your favorite fast food restaurant, for example. Yep. Um, but we are seeing some cross-platform stuff. Like, I mean, I, you know, you do see like if you use Lyft or if you use Starbucks, then you can earn miles for certain airlines, things like that. But that's still very, very small uh, percentage of the total rewards puzzle, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think and I, you're, you're right. And in fact, we say Starbucks. Starbucks is, I think, has long been, you know, the leader when it comes to sort of mainstream consumer loyalty and really is typically several years, you know, ahead of folks. And in addition to some of the kind of partnerships and sort of coalition loyalty offers that you're referring to, Paul, they also very interesting launched what's called their Odyssey initiative uh, last year. And so this was a full blown uh, sort of Web3. And again, we could get into that. If you ask 10 people in the industry their definition of Web3, you'd probably get 10 distinct definitions uh, back. But, um, you know, uh, they're using they're using, uh, you know, blockchain and um, they're creating these, you know, loyalty collectibles and uh, basically these assets that their loyalty members can earn to unlock exclusive rewards. They're transferable, they're tradable. So this sort of open, more open loyalty paradigm, as opposed to all these little closed silos that don't talk to each other, uh, I think is what we believe, you know, one of the directions in which we're heading. Uh, you know, is that entirely riskless? Of course not. You know, there's a lot of businesses that are going to say, well, you know, I don't know. I don't like the idea. You know, I, I appreciate the ability to have the kind of, uh, you know, the closed silo. But again, we've seen it time and time again, you know, consumers ultimately are going to be the ones kind of setting the, the tone. And as you have the Starbucks of the world going to meet that, you know, you'll have others that, that come and, and feel they have to follow to, to remain competitive. And to piggyback off that a little, you know, before my time at Dell, I saw a lot of it, you know, firsthand at um, at Nordstrom, just implementing like a really, really solid, you know, loyalty program. And, you know, I just constantly saw people that just kind of had this, you know, sick and tired of being pitched for just onboarding to a program. You're like, hey, would you like to do this? And, and it was like a pretty, you know, cumbersome process. You know, you had to provide your ID or you know, sign up and give all this information while you're just trying to check out. You know, you've already probably done the actual transactional experience or even if it's online you know it's a lot of sometimes it's a lot of steps and i think the unique you know thing that bitcoin brings is like while some of these retailers might you know can be online offline you know what have you um again it was it's always very clunky but with with bitcoin a lot of these things are just simple as like you know downloading one app and then you can just scan a standard qr code you know that's really all it takes so the, the actual like technology and the rails behind the scenes is becoming far more seamless and as you know you all alluded to this open interoperability, if you will, um, just makes that, you know, type of pitch to these people that might not yet be on your rewards program that much easier because they only need really one app versus the 50 different pitches that they hear at, you know, all the different retailers or services that they engage with daily. So, you know, I do think that's an added benefit that, you know, consumers are going to drive a, a bit more until maybe retail and, you know, others kind of catch up, you know, maybe not the big ones like Delta, Hilton, and so on and so forth, but the ones that are maybe a little lower tier, if you will. No, it makes sense. I mean, like anything else, I mean, we see this in financial services as certain brands, particularly outside of financial services, improve the customer experience, uh, you know, just make things so much, it raises the expectations. And then that tends to set a higher bar and a higher standard for for everyone in a lot of ways. Um, let's talk about the idea of creating more flexibility more choice, um, you know, or, or is that something that's really done kind of more on the customer facing end? Is it really on data sharing? And it just help also then fill, fill us in on how Jolt's really kind of meets that need and kind of, you know, the product set that you guys have to provide that flexibility and optionality for, for consumers. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, when we say flexibility and optionality, there's of course many ways to address that. And I think what we've really done is um, provided one of many potential responses and answers to that. I think the reason we think Bitcoin is so interesting as, a, uh, as an option is a fewfold. One, you look at the consumer profile or persona behind you know bitcoin adopters crypto adopters whatever we want to call them um and there's some really good you know studies coming out now these are folks that tend to skew a little bit younger not surprisingly right you have an over indexing among millennials gen z all that 
But despite their relative youth, they also tend to skew more affluent. They're, you know, slightly higher income than than average. That's a pretty rare combination of traits to be able to, you know, have in a single consumer segment that you can reach with a, a, a sort of targeted proposition. So you have, and you know, they also tend to be quite savvy consumers. Um, so you have this like very attractive uh, segment that also happens to be growing very fast. Um, for context, so folks are aware, probably about 20% of the U.S. population has held, used, um, you know, bought, sold, done something with Bitcoin and crypto. So tw about 20%. But that number is growing globally uh, faster than the internet did at a comparable point in its growth curve. And so I think the key takeaway there is, is you know, humans were not very good at visualizing and thinking of things in, in uh, you know, exponential terms. And so, OK, 20 percent today. But, you know, what is that next year? What is that the year after? That is growing so fast that I think we'll look back and say, oh, gosh, you know, 2023 or, 20, you know, early 2024, whatever it is, that was really the time to be thinking about some of this stuff. So you have an attractive consumer segment that happens to be growing very fast. And then the final piece that, um, you know, kind of justifies why we've really focused on enabling businesses to offer this new type of asset is that this consumer segment tends to be very motivated. Um, you know, we've done some surveys of our own and, and some studies of our own. Um, you know, we've asked crypto adopters how, you know, questions like how likely would you be to switch allegiance from one uh, business to another if it meant that you could earn Bitcoin as, you know, as a loyalty reward. And so not surprisingly, you know, 90% would be definitely likely or most likely. Obviously, a survey is very different than actually, you know, voting with your uh, you know, in, in, in reality, but there is a very, very strong signal there. So these tend to be folks that have very strong beliefs behind this new asset class. Um, and so you end up with a very compelling proposition. We're certainly not saying, hey, go blow up your existing program, but rather here is a particular way that you can increase the flexibility and optionality in your program in a way that attaches to this highly attractive consumer segment. And oh, by the way, the other nice thing about this is as Steven was mentioning, it's it's open, right? So you have a lot more kind of seamlessness, fewer friction points with how these different uh, rewards can be delivered. Um, and uh, what was the other point I was gonna say? Um, maybe Steve, I'll, I'll, I'll shut I was up gonna, and ask. I was gonna say from like a, yeah, I was gonna say, for maybe from like a technical standpoint, to what you're, um, you know, asking, you know, why, you know, why Bitcoin and maybe how Jolts enables this is, you know, again, the, you know, the way we see it is that, you know, this global adoption, if you will, you know, the as he said, these persona and these portfolios all generally hold Bitcoin, even if they hold something else. But from a technical standpoint, you know, if you're gonna build something, you want to build it on a solid foundation. You know, you want a granite, you know, strong foundation. And in terms of Bitcoin, you know, there's just nothing, you know, to compare to it. Now, again, it might have um, you know, some FUD, as you like to hear, you know, things that, you know, you might hear in the news that Bitcoin is bad for whatever reason, but, you know, in terms of uptime, you know, it never goes down. Um, the rules don't change, uh, you know, very often, um, where other, you know, protocols and, you know, networks and blockchains, they do, um, where people can just vote and simply change the rules. So if you're building on something, you know, that's going to have this option and I'll provide this, you know, as a part of your loyalty rewards program, you're going to want something that's, you know, I think fairly neutral um, and dependable. And again, there's just nothing that even comes close to Bitcoin in terms of that security, the uptime. Um, and then you'll, you know, mostly hear from other changes like the scalability or the speed and fees. And while I think, you know, others certainly can do that, again, they have all the caveats and downfalls of the things I just mentioned. But, um, you know, what is, I think, even more interesting than maybe just the Bitcoin adoption is what you might hear is the L2 layer, which is called Lightning, the Lightning Network. And that is also exponentially growing, um, which allows you to do all these types of really cool interactions, sending payments back and forth. Um, there's a new uh, protocol on top of, um, well, not new protocol, but one of the first um, uh, iterations and um, deliverables of what is called Taproot Assets, which is what we're working on, um, that allows you to bring what all these other protocols and, you know, ETH, Ethereum and Polygon that, you know, they claim they could only do and you couldn't do on Bitcoin. You can now do that at scale 
on Bitcoin, on L2, on the Lightning Network. So now you kind of have this whole suite of capabilities, you know, that again, anchor into Bitcoin, that all these other, you know, networks and protocols, you know, were claiming the fame. Um, but now you can do that on the most secure and again, kind of stable foundation. I think, again, if you're going to build somewhere, you're going to want to do it on that where the rules don't change. You know, it's going to be up. You have a scalable solution, low fee environment, and you have all the bells and whistles that, you know, everybody else has. And that's what we've really tried to do at Jolts, which is, you know, provide a kind of really plug and play way that any brand, you know, again, can just layer this into their existing app. There's no, um, you know, there's no prerequisites or some type of, you know, additional steps that they need to take, like install a browser extension or go get the Jolts app per se. Um, we have an API, you know, that can, again, just plop you know, Bitcoin rewards or incentives into your you know, mobile app, your website, you know, what have you. Um, you know, we can do things as interesting as like referrals. Um, you know, there's a lot of different incentives and rewards that, you know, can be thought of from a brand, depending on, you know, what context they're thinking in. It doesn't necessarily have to be transactional. It could be, you know, user engagement. It could be onboarding flows. It could be, you know, any type of way you think of sprinkling incentives into your app or service. And so that's why I really think Jolts has really tried to differentiate itself of just not simply thinking through, you know, just maybe solely consumer loyalty and rewards, but really just like user incentives as well as consumer and you know loyalty and rewards. Sure. Yeah, I'm thinking about this also in terms of, you know, strategic alignment and strategic fit, right? So, you know, there are certain demographic groups that seem more engaged in the concept of crypto, Bitcoin, et cetera. Does that kind of influence the right partners for you guys to work on, you know, in terms of who you work with to offer those incentives? It seems like the best partners are the ones whose demographic core fits and aligns with the folks that are interested in this reward in the first place. I think that's true to, true to a degree, although we've also found, um, you know, some success. I, I think the key is to make this very much opt-in, right? You're not forcing this on people. Uh, you know, you're you're not kind of um, blanketing this too much. Uh, I think there's even also a lot of interesting ways that you can do some kind of internal sampling. You know, you can take your customer base. There's different ways to sort of model out like propensity to engage with crypto, you know, stuff, right? Um, and and so I I think that's oftentimes a good way for organizations to kind of test their way into this. It's not, you know. You know, send it all out, send it to everyone, but rather maybe a targeted campaign where you're targeting some of the types of folks who, again, maybe, you know, the, the younger sort of um, profile, younger generations, that would be a very easy, you know, method by which to target an initial campaign. And then you, you can learn, right? And you can sort of say, hey, you know, I mean, you could do all sorts of stuff. You could say, you know, it could be a balance transfer campaign. It could be a cross-sell campaign. It could be, uh, you know, spend you know, hundred dollars in your card over the next whatever, or make X transactions, you know, on your card, all the, all the kind of natural standard types of campaigns that you might think about. And you can use that to test in and see, okay, my customer base, you know, is very enthusiastic about this, or um, maybe that's, it's this particular segment that is, and I can, you know, by offering this, I can now attract new customers that also look like this you know particular segment so I, I think we would always sort of uh recommend a you know a kind of testing and iterative approach but to your direct question paul um i, I don't necessarily think we've seen you know a, a huge limitation as of yet mm -hmm. you know ob obviously of, of course it's the case that you know maybe a brand that has that natural existing affinity to kind of younger generations of course that's going to be on average a better uh, sort of, um, you know, beachhead for some of this, but, but again, if you're doing this and introducing this in the right way to your customer base, I think, I think really any organization can, um, you know, can at least tap into this and, and, and test, learn, see, yeah, that's, that's really the key. And I think the other thing comes down to like, even just in the testing phase, uh, of rolling this out is again, like what we very much focus on is like just the end user you know, user experience, like how do you make this as simple as possible? Because, you know, again, depending on, you know, geography or demographic, um, yeah, you know, a lot of what goes on in the crypto realm is, uh, can be pretty daunting and scare a lot of people off. You know, people see like, oh, if I have to get my own wallet or, you know, back up a phrase, seed phrase or something, that'll scare a lot of people off. Or even just, you know, going into some of these, you know, online marketplaces or what have you, there's still some tasks that would throw a lot of people off. And so we've, 
uh, you know, just for like a testing purpose, you know, uh, if somebody wanted to implement dip their toes or whatever, again, you can do this in ways where the user experience is very simple. You know, this could be something where it's just like, yeah, your rewards are tied to your email or a cost, you know, user ID. Um, you know, these don't have to be actual things that are, again, sent to someone in their own, uh, what we like to call it, like a self-custodial wallet, um, just for like, again, testing purposes. So just making the the process very, very easy um, just to kind of, you know, understand and learn, as we said, you don't have to do the, the full throated, you know, all, all the way self custody and backing up of things. But we, we try to convey that you should eventually do that or go, go along that path at, at some point. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a journey there partially with some educational elements involved as well as long, along the way. So, oh yeah, for sure. Um, and there's different use cases would love too. To talk I mean, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about the, the suite of products and the tools you guys offer. And we love obviously with, with, with SRM to talk in terms of use cases. So, I mean, if you could uh, share some of those, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, the, the way we've designed our, our offerings is really intended to be able to speak to just about any part of the customer lifecycle. Um, you know, this can obviously be a very potent way to acquire new customers, um, which, I mean, I've, you know, everyone has to be thinking about currently. So, for example, we have some customers that are running um, like referral programs with Bitcoin rewards. So, you know, I refer someone uh, to business, I get rewarded in Bitcoin. Uh, the beautiful thing about uh, kind of tying back to that motivation point earlier, these folks tend to seek out others that also like Bitcoin and crypto or they're, you know, deeply immersed in, in this community. This is not just kind of like a, a, you know, I think if there's one thing to take away, uh, this is not just like, a, oh, you know, I'm very loyal to Starbucks. You know, this is something that a lot of people have a much, much, much deeper affinity to. And so, you know, that's one powerful way that organizations can uh, take advantage of what we have. So our, our product itself is uh, an API that allows businesses to bring these Bitcoin reward experiences into their app, business, website. Um, you know, again, it could be a, a, a simple kind of email type campaign to start. So there's a lot of different ways you could kind of get started, but um, the goal is to for for us to be able to take all of that complexity away. So you don't have to spin up a Bitcoin node, or you don't have to kind of um, spin up at these additional infrastructure or have someone internally that has expertise in any of this stuff. Um, you know, it's it's about getting all of this, uh, you know, upside without any of the hassle uh, of having to, you know, learn kind of a whole new, whole new paradigm. So um, customer acquisition and referrals is a big one. Um, you know, you can also tie these rewards to just about any kind of customer engagement uh, action, right? It could be, you know, making a making a purchase on a card. Um, it could be reaching a certain threshold of spend uh, over, you know, a certain time frame. Uh, it could be, again, maybe it's like a cross sell campaign. You know, they've you've, you've got a uh, you know this customer relationship has has a card with you, but you know maybe you run a balance transfer campaign. So again, like. Any of those sort of life cycle marketing type campaigns, this can be a nice sort of alternative um, uh, uh, option that you can offer folks. And I'll say really uh, quick, another quick, one another, that, go ahead, Steve. Three, you know, say just as a another use case that we kind of stumbled across of is not even just like consumer loyalty, but actually internal, like employee rewards. You know, a lot of people want optionality when they get benefits throughout the year. You know, it's your birthday, you get a you know twenty five hundred points to spend in your you know, at your company's store, there's a uh, you know, very compelling use case there for optionality as well. I mean, these people are, we're all consumers. Um, so I think that's another interesting use case just to highlight that we've, we've kind of stumbled across recently that is um, equally as compelling. Exactly. And then maybe the last sort of example I would throw out, and we, Stephen alluded to it earlier, is, you know, this idea of, of like loyalty collectibles. I, I think in a financial institution context, we probably need to think about like what, you know, what, what should that look like? But um, you know, uh, taking Starbucks as an example, like some of these loyalty collectibles that you can collect and uh, earn by doing different things, you know, a uh, certain amount of spend with Starbucks, but not just that, it's also like taking, you know, they've got educational content. And so you could, for example, you know, earn the ability to go visit like a local coffee, you know, farm where Starbucks, you know, uh, uh, has, you know, um, uh, suppliers, for example. Uh, there's some like really cool kind of vintage vintage esque art that um, you know from some of the earlier like Starbucks sort of um, 
uh, you know, locations that that you know is also something that people can kind of earn or or engage in. So so again, I think this would be something akin to um, uh, you know, th like this could be something akin to just specifying different tiers uh, of loyalty. And what's cool about these assets is that you can, because they're sort of tradable, you can enable people to kind of buy their way into additional tiers of loyalty. You see this often with uh, airlines, you know, they might run uh, an offer where, hey, you could buy your way into silver tier for, you know, X. So these types of loyalty collectibles can facilitate sort of experiences like that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, the, the, the range, it's really any consumer, any customer behavior that you want to incentivize, whether acquisition, uh, engagement, uh, you know, retention, right? Like you could look at, you know, um, you could look at the set of cardholders that haven't spent on their card in the last month and try to do a reactivation campaign. So any of those sort of life, life cycle campaigns, you can introduce and see to what degree is Bitcoin a more powerful incentive for, you know, some folks, I mean, maybe for others, it's something different. Uh, but but that's kind of the beauty of of how we've built our suite of solutions is um, you can kind of sprinkle uh, these these satoshis, which is the subunit of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, you know, a lot of people think, oh my gosh, you know, thirty whatever thousand, you know, it's but it's actually very very divisible. Um, you know, down to a single satoshi is probably you know point zero zero two yeah, uh, you know dollars at at this point. So that that can also unlock some pretty interesting sort of micro reward use cases. Like what about sharing, you know, your blog post on social media? I mean, the, the, you can get pretty creative um, and, and that's kind of the part of the beauty of, of, this, of this type of asset is, um, you know, it's very divisible. It's very, uh, you can plug it into all sorts of stuff. I was gonna say, I mean, <laughs> I think of things like, you know, tying it into, people being influencers and promoting the brand, right? Or even gamification, for example, with finance, say financial literacy in the financial services industry. I mean, there could be some options there as well. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. The education modules, just onboarding. There's always always different ways you can sprinkle some stats. Um, wanted to kind of look as we go into 2024, right? And obviously Bitcoin, crypto, ups and downs, ups and downs. I mean, there are couple of black eyes, I think, in the crypto exchange area, you know, for example. Yes. But you know, how how should financial institutions kind of look at this space as we head into 2024? And 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 particularly in terms of you know working with folks like you guys and incorporating something like this into the, the platform. I mean, obviously it's there's cyclicality, there's ups and downs, yep. but what are some of the constants and what are some of the reasons why you know financial institutions should should have an open mind about this? Yeah, it's a good question, right? Because from 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 the outside, this looks awfully chaotic, right? It's um, and there's a very funny website that has tracked. Uh, I think it's Bitcoin Obituaries dot com or you know something like that, and it tracks the number of times that you know mainstream publications have come out and said, "Oh, you know, Bitcoin's dead, right? It's dead." And there's you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds uh, of these uh, over the years, and people right. It's also, like it's like the Mar it's like the Mark Twain adage, right? The rumors of my demise. Yes, exactly, exactly. And you know, there's um, so so that's that's been been sort of funny to see. And so again, we get it. Like if you're not sort of looking at this, you know, very very closely, like we are, it seems chaotic. And then it doesn't help the industry when you have you know the FTXs of the world that uh, that blow up. And I mean, there were as we're seeing come out now, you know, truly criminal things happening. And so I think it is important to differentiate bad actors in a uh, new and emerging industry from the sort of underlying technology as well. I mean, you saw a lot of, you know, Mavericks as part of the, you know, dot com boom and bust and, and, and this and that. And so what sort of rose out of the ashes from the dot com uh, kind of bubble, if you will, were businesses that have now defined what we think of when we think of, uh, you know, the Apples of the world, the Microsofts of the world, all these different things. And so um, to, to maybe demystify the cycle of Bitcoin a little bit for folks, because I do think that's really important. Like what appears to be very chaotic from the outside, actually, believe it or not, has some semblance of, of order. Um, that's not to say it's all perfectly predictable, but 
every four years, what happens is uh, the Bitcoin protocol, the sort of rules that participants of this network you know, have, have chosen to abide by, every four years, the new supply or the new issuance of Bitcoin, the rate of that gets cut in half um, every four years. And so this kicks off this like very interesting dance uh, within the market in anticipation of that event, a lot of what we call long-term hodlers. So these are individuals that are really holding Bitcoin as you know, similar to, to maybe gold, right? They, they view this as a store of value. They're holding this for the long run. They're not trading it day to day. Um, this for them is a, maybe a portfolio hedge, uh, right? It's a, it's a long-term um, sort of savings. And so what happens as you approach this known, you know, halving event, as it's called, where the new supply gets cut in half, all of these long-term hodlers are, are sort of clutching their Bitcoin very tightly. And so you see the supply side of the equation getting very, very, very tight. And when that happens, again, people are not used to an asset or a digital commodity like Bitcoin that is absolutely scarce. There will only be 21 million. What happens with a typical commodity, even gold, right? You know, if the price of gold rips, there's usually going to be, um, you know, entrants coming in that will increase the supply uh, of that commodity. So Bitcoin is very, very unique in that regard. So you have the supply side very tight, and then all you need is some sort of demand side catalyst. And that is what catapults price, you know, and then you have, of course, speculators that pile in, push that to truly extremes, and then you've got the bust and you resettle at a higher level than what the prior cycle was, right? So like that's what's happening here. And that is not to say that uh, that, that that makes it perfectly acceptable for every organization to, to interact with. There's still a lot of volatility at this early stage. But um, the reason I think this conversation is hopefully timely, if you leave with nothing else from this conversation, mm -hmm. I think we would just invite you to, uh, you know, to, to, to be sort of, um, in, intrigued by this and, you know, maybe maybe have a closer look, you've got, um, so you've got that supply dynamic happening that I just described. And then on the demand side, what everyone's in uh, waiting in anticipation for is the approval of the Bitcoin spot ETFs, right? And so this is something that uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, there's a number of the largest financial institutions that are uh, backing these ETFs. Uh, you have Larry Fink coming on CNBC talking about crypto as being this flight to quality, right? This is a very different narrative than we've heard at any time in the past. And so I think it, I think it really pays to be paying attention right now because the narrative around Bitcoin and crypto is changing basically on a 180. And it is because these big institutions are, are coming in and uh, the SEC has finally now, you know, come to the table. They're working with, uh, you know, regulators to put this uh, investment vehicle out there. And so it's increasingly becoming a when, not if, that the ETFs will be um, approved. And so that, in a lot of people's minds, is probably the sort of catalyst that kicks off this next uh, this next cycle, which, you know, we would expect to be sort of latter half of 2024 into 2025. And so when you ask the question, well, okay, great, like, wh so what? I think the point is that by the time you get to that, that point in time, there will already be a, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement within the market. And so the question is like, is, it, is that you know, early enough? And so what I think we would invite organizations to do is, you know, maybe it's rewards, maybe it's something completely different. But is there something that makes sense to start looking at in this new asset class, given some of those pieces that are falling uh, that are falling in, in in place? So that would kind of be my my perspective. But Steve, I don't know if you if you'd add uh, add anything to add any kindling. Uh, I would just say really, yeah, I'll just say really quick. You know, even in the U.S., you know, that's obviously progress. And um, but you know, other countries are making these moves too. You know, like sovereign countries, governments, you know, you have Mexico, yep. a lot of, you know, senators and leaders out there, you know, being proponents. You have obviously El Salvador is a great case. Um, other, 
you know, ones in uh, Southeast Asia, um, other countries are coming and starting to declare that Bitcoin is okay to use. So you have, you know, this regulatory hurdle and approval that's kind of, you know, being overcome. And then um, maybe just last point is, you know, uh, you know, why should, you know, everyone be looking at this is, you know, really it's just only one asset that, you know, if you want your end consumer purchasing with you, there's only one asset that's going to be able to, you know, allow them to, you know, basically keep their purchasing power. Um, you know, it's the best performing asset in the, since its inception. I mean, there's, it's not debatable. Um, so if you want consumers to keep coming and shopping with you, um, there's only one asset that does that. And it's unfortunately not the dollar. Uh, it's unfortunately not other assets that are easily spendable. So it's a harsh reality, but um, you know, I think, you know, businesses really have to start considering, you know, what it is that, you know, these consumers are spending back with them. Great, Pat. Well, I'll ask one last question, then we'll open it up uh, to uh, our audience Q&A. But obviously, um, you guys have a lot of experience in loyalty and rewards, that kind of stuff. I'd love for you guys just to broad base, not just within the confines of the, the Jolts platform, but what what are the real attributes for a successful, enduring customer loyalty, customer engagement platform? Great question. Uh, it's hard to boil it down. I, I, but, um, you know, I, I think there's the there's the kind of persona behind it. Like it has to be authentic. We've seen a lot of organizations. It, there's nothing wrong with testing, right? That was my whole background: test and learn. So you want to you you want to always be kind of testing new ideas. Um, but the things that have really stuck are things where there there is at least some authenticity behind it. Consumers can sniff out if you're just sort of trying the you know the latest sort of fad and and so so doing some of these new ideas um you know there's a spectrum of how you do it that really matters but there's got to be authenticity to it um there has to be yeah there, there just has to be kind of that those fundamental pillars of of value right if your program Real is value. devaluing and, and bleeding value at 10 20 percent you know plus a year like you know you just can't credibly look yourself in the mirror and say you know, consumers are getting a, a really, really great sort of deal with this. And, you know, we get it, right? It's, there's there's business considerations. You need to manage breakage as part of a program. You know, a little bit of breakage, you know, arguably good, uh, but too much, it, it just means you're not getting the value. And so, um, you know, one of the statistics that I would I would sort of uh, plant maybe in people's heads is um, McKinsey did a, did a study and analysis and showed that about two thirds of loyalty programs don't break even, meaning that the incremental benefits you're getting as a result of that program do not offset the cost of the rewards and the cost of maintaining uh, the, the the program. And so, again, like making sure that you know your 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 sort of point value and what those points can buy is is relatively stable over time is critical. Um, thinking about how you can introduce additional optionality. Bitcoin and crypto is one flavor of that. It's a flavor that we think is potentially very potent, given the kind of consumer dynamics we described earlier. But there's certainly there's certainly others. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's sort of like back. You know, it's kind of this like back to basics sort of thing. You know, don't don't rob consumers of their purchasing power in the in the in their rewards and 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 you know try and expand that kind of library of redemption options as much as you can. And um, I, I think a lot will, will will follow if you can just do those two things very well. Oh, Paul, I think you might be on mute. Uh, yeah, You're I good. got it. Uh, yeah, so we've got a few more minutes. Anybody uh, attending have a question? Um, feel free to unmute, fire away. You guys must have knocked it out of the park here because uh, stunned, stunned, stunned silence. It either did really well or, or terrible. Well, we're going to give ourselves credit and a pat on the back for this one. Let's just <laughs> let's do that. But I mean, I, all right, I'll ask I'll ask one more question then in terms of, you know, you mentioned the APIs, right? And I don't yeah. want to get way in the weeds with this, but obviously one of the difficulties with financial firms is always trying to make sure that those APIs connect properly to existing infrastructure and technology. Uh, you guys have, how does that work for you guys, you know, without obviously getting way, way, way in the high grass, but. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's some regulatory stuff we're aware of, you know, with being like 
SOC 2 compliant and things like that, um, which right. always, you know, can be addressed. But in terms of, you know, our API, um, again, not to maybe get too technical, but um, yeah, I mean, it's written in, in Go. Um, we do have also simple REST uh, API wrapper as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, any, any, you know, team that's, you know, technical team is going to be able to, you know, dig through it, sift through it, be able to understand, you know, how this works. Again, it's a common standard and, um, you know, Go is becoming increasingly popular, um, scales well, um, which is why we chose it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, again, the the idea, even with our API um, and our SDK, which I think is equally as um, important, um, just because, again, that's how you would uh, ultimately give, you know, the end consumer or user their, their, their rewards or their Bitcoin, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just kind of plug and play, plop it in there. Um, you know, it works from web, works for mobile. So, again, there's really no... Uh, technical or you know a tech stack environment that it, it can't you know uh, talk with um it really just comes down to like what are those triggers what are those events that you know would justify a reward and then you know when do you send it um and obviously some guardrails that come in place because again some places might not want to allow people to withdraw sometimes they might have to meet a certain threshold or again take some certain action before the rewards are um, either redeemed or claimed um but yeah, I mean, again, we're we're happy to share our docs. Um, anyone can can look at them. Um, we're we're constantly adding to it as well, just because you know we're we're here on the cutting edge of lightning and what we're and what we're um what we're building. But um, and I think the other maybe point is just again, you don't have to touch Bitcoin. Um, you know, again, maybe for some larger scale, like really really large scale uh, programs, we would maybe need to work with some work a custom thing out. Um, just if you've got you know tens, if not hundreds of thousand dollars of Bitcoin moving around a day. Um, but, uh, other than that, yeah, it's just, you know, we deal with it so you don't have to touch it. And, um, you know, everything is just between us, you know, financially speaking is just done in, in dollars. And the, the only other thing I would add is, um, you know, it's just a sort, sort of two paths, right? You know, there's one path where, you know, if you do have a, a technical team, you know, really any developer is going to be able to use, you know, our APIs. Um, the other thing that we are keenly, you know, looking at is, uh, other types of platforms with into which we can integrate so for example if you're already using you know a digital banking platform or you're already using uh you know a particular loyalty platform etc um, we can certainly look into integrating within that uh existing kind of platform so um you know if there is interest from from the audience or from from folks who watch this afterwards uh and and you know you say hey we're already using this like can you you know, could you integrate with that? That would be a very helpful, um, you know, helpful feedback. You know, we've got a, a short list of uh, of entities that we're eyeing up, but um, that would be, you know, another another sort of piece. And then as I was kind of emphasizing earlier, like there is a very, very simple way to test this out. Um, we talk about APIs and, you know, that conjures the thoughts of, you know, IT projects and all this crazy stuff. Like we, we totally get it. I totally get it. You know, live that in my in my past life. But um, you know, if it's just around like building a business case around whether you you know your customers value this or not, there's very very simple ways. Like we could literally do that over an email campaign, um, where you know you send a send an email out to you know a, a test sample of your customers. Hey, you know, over the next three months, if you spend at least this much on your card, you know, you'll get this reward in Bitcoin. Um, and you know, we can at the end of that period, whoever qualifies for the reward, you know, we can deliver that very, very easily over email, giving them a super, super simple way to claim their reward. And then you can kind of see, okay, like people really like this, or you know, hey, this was fine, but maybe the timing, you know, maybe the timing's not right. Um, whatever. So I would just emphasize that there are ways to kind of test this out in order to build up that that business case for a more uh kind of proper integration if you will so you know we're um and and if you have absolutely no interest whatsoever in anything that we offer uh we would always still be happy to share thoughts and insights about um about the industry about this uh fascinating emerging asset class we've we've sort of seen a lot in the space and um, and I, I, I think if you leave with absolutely nothing else, um, I think it is at, at least a call to action to look more deeply into this thing. I think we've uh, um, we've passed the sort of uh, 
you know, people have called it a, tu a tulip, right? The Dutch tulip uh, craze, you know, and, and this, if you look at that on a, on a time series, you know, chart, it's sort of like, doo -doo, you know, Bitcoin has, has, has much, much, much uh, kind of off, uh, uh, gone, you know, past that. So I think it's the time to pay attention. It's the time that this asset class is really coming into, uh, you know, a, a more serious kind of stage and arena. I mean, BlackRock does not get up in the morning for less than whatever, right? So I, I think there's a lot of signals that folks should be paying attention to. And um, so we're, all, we're always happy to kind of, you know, help answer more general questions about, about it. But, um, but yeah, hopefully this, this at least comes from some, uh, some interesting thoughts. Yeah, well, Ian, Stephen, I appreciate uh, you guys making the time to talk to us today. And I will say, I think, folks, if there's a, if you want more information, you want to learn more, the website is joltsrewards.com, and that's jolts with a Z, like zebra. Yes. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Jolts with a yeah. Z, rewards.com. Um, you know, you can find our docs there. You can find, uh, you can request access to the API if you want to have, you know, a developer take a look. Um, or I don't know, Paul, how you, I mean, we're, we're very happy if you want to, you know, share our emails and, if folks do want to reach out or or if you know folks want to funnel questions through you guys uh sure. we're, we're we're easy so you know whatever is uh whatever's helpful well, again again appreciate you guys making the time uh again this is uh paul davis director of market intelligence with srm and uh this has been the latest episode of our srm tech talks thank you everybody thanks guys thanks guys.